Our message title today is The Armor of God, hence the soldier. <coughs> this is a fourth and final installment of our uh, four-part series on the book of Ephesians. What we've done in our first message, we looked at the Spirit of God. We looked at the steps of salvation and understand that the Spirit's responsibility in our salvation is the Holy Spirit seals us in Jesus. He keeps us sealed there. We'll never ever lose our salvation because He has sealed us into Jesus Christ. And then in our second message, we spoke about the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, not, not of works. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. We are undeserving sinners. Born into sin, born into this world, we deserve death and hell. But God in his glory and grace bestowed upon us that pardon. He forgave us of our sins and took that away and said, I have now pardoned you. And in that gave us his grace. We cannot earn it and we definitely don't deserve it. And then last week we looked at the pillars of God. Let me see who took a photo of yourself by the pillars. No one. Oh, come on. <laughs> If you look outside the church, you'll see these seven pillars that line up the, the face of the church. And these are actually not just by decoration. These were purposefully put there by St. Mark's Church. And it represents the, the unity of the Christian church in Ephesians chapter 4. It talks about the ones, the one spirit, one Lord, one hope, one faith, one God and Father of all. And these are the pillars of our faith, doctrinal truths and beliefs that not only the Christian church is built, but you as a Christian should build your Life upon two. So today we come to our fourth and final installment of the series entitled The Armor of God. You know, during World War II, when you were stationed at your different places, in the, in the Navy, you were all put onto this big battleship and you'd all go out to where the enemy was. So each person on that battleship had a role and responsibility. Whether you were a cook or a cleaner or doing the radar, whatever it was, each person had a responsibility on that battleship. But then there would come a time when they would hear the voice over the intercom. And it would say these words, battle stations, battle stations, take your battle stations. And then everybody would drop what they're doing. And they would run towards their battle station. They'll get dressed up in the right, correct gear, take their correct weapon, and know exactly who they were fighting against. I wonder what would happen today in a spiritual sense if God cried out to the church, battle stations, Battle stations, take your battle stations. Will we know what to do? Will we know what to wear? Will we know what weapon to fight with? And will we even know who our enemy is? Well, we know that the book of Ephesians, Paul writes and he tells us exactly that. He gives us the answer to who our enemy is, to what we will be wearing, and what we will fight with. So let's open up our Bibles as we turn to Ephesians chapter 6 on the screen for your convenience. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to be reading from verses 10 to 17. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. It's a great way to start. It's not in our strength, it's in the Lord's strength and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That's our enemy, the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our fight is not against one another. Our fight is not physical. It's spiritual. And we're fighting against the devil and his demons. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand then firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So you might think these words sound a bit odd because where does Paul get all these ideas from? Well, we must understand the context. Paul was writing this letter, while he was in prison in Rome. And in Rome, he'd be very familiar with the Roman soldiers. So while he was penning this letter, he was probably just looking at the Roman soldiers and he caught his eye on what they were wearing. And he thought, you know what, that's a good thing to use as an object lesson. And that's exactly what he done. He took the armor of the Roman soldier 
and he had a spiritual truth applied to it. And that's what we want to do today. We want to look at the physical armor and then apply a spiritual truth to your life. So let's start. We got our good friend Marcus. Everyone say, hi, Marcus. Marcus will not say hello back. I trust him. <laughs> there we go. Your belt is now correct. So what we want to do, we want to let Marcus help us and understand visually what this armor was, what it looked like, and what it applies to us. Let's, let's look at the first one, the belt of truth. So the belt we can see was a leather belt that was around the waist. Its first object was to actually hold the sword. So that was its first main function. It was also there to actually just tie the tunic because what they wore was this like tunic which was like a short bathrobe. And you don't want a soldier running into battle with things flapping all around. It just won't look cool, all right? <laughs> so, so what they done was they had a belt to just tie everything in place, all right? So now they can run and they're ready for it. So that's what the belt was for. Physical armor, spiritual truth. The belt of what? Truth. The belt of truth. What is the truth? The truth is the word of God. More particularly, it is the word who is God, and that's Jesus Christ himself. Jesus said, I am the way, the, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus says these words also in John 8.32. Thank you, Marius. John 8.32, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ. We are saved and set free from our sin because of Jesus and his truth. It's not only the truth that is in Jesus, but the truth that is the word of God itself. The enemy is going to come, and he's going to try and deceive you, and he's going to bring deception into the church, all false doctrines, doctrines of demons. How will you know what is a, what is a lie and what is truth if you don't know yourself? So Christians, you have to start reading the Bible so you can know what is right and what is wrong. From the day I got here, I've been shouting at you people to read your Bibles. I don't know if it's helped yet, but I will continue to shout until my dying day. It is imperative for Christians to read the Word of God. We're running onto the battlefield not knowing what's right and wrong. So when people come with different doctrines from the pulpit or from YouTube videos or someone says something, you fall over as a soldier because you're not grounded in the Word of Truth. And you must get to read this every day. I've even got a Bible I brought that I'll show you. This is my Bible I read every day. It's 365. So every day you get a day where you read the scriptures. We've got to start doing that. Don't just haphazardly open the Bible up and just read every one. Systematically go through the Bible. Wherever you want to start, you start. But systematically work your way through the Bible. Imperative for Christians to study the Word of God. Can I say that again? Because a lot of us read the Bible. But when it comes to studying, whoa, my days of school are over. That was in like 1952. You must still study the Bible. We have wonderful home groups on Wednesday evenings. I have a group here on Wednesday mornings, uh, half past nine. And we also start in one up in the evenings at six o'clock. So there's no excuse for you not to come to one of these studies, these home groups, and get grounded in the Word of God. Your first level of defense is your belt of truth. So let's look at our next one, the belt of truth, and then the breastplate of righteousness. As you can see, the breastplate was a metal shield that covered all the vital organs of the body, particularly the heart. If a spear or an arrow hit the heart, then it's game over. Do not pass begin. Do not collect 200 bucks. It's done and dusted. So we need that breastplate to protect the vital organs. It's a breastplate of what? A breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness means to be made right with God. Let me ask you a question today. Put up your hand if you're righteous. A couple of you very arrogant people out there. Jack, I see you, I see you. <laughs> Put up your hand if you're righteous. Okay, no, not too many of you. So the rest of you are pretty much sinners. All right? So you, you might say, well, not this week, right? Maybe ask me next week if I'm righteous. This week was pretty dodgy. All right, but sketchy for me. But you may have misunderstood the question. I didn't ask you if you were self-righteous. Self-righteous is arrogance. I ask you if you were righteous. And I just told you what righteous means. To be made right with God. Are you made right with God? Yes, hallelujah. Why? By the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Put up your hand if you are righteous. Everybody put up your hand because you are all righteous. You cannot get into heaven if you are not righteous. So when somebody says, are you righteous? You say confidently, yes, I am. Not in my own righteousness, but by the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Let us read that in 1 Corinthians. It says this, 1 Corinthians 
130. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. All of those things you have right now, not because of yourselves, but because of Jesus Christ and what he did for you 2,000 years ago. The Bible says, for by him, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. It's not your righteousness, it's God's righteousness. We are placed in Jesus. Now you are holy and righteous because of him. We have the belt of truth that comes from Jesus, the breastplate of righteousness that comes from Jesus. Let's look at our next one, which is, I think, the shoes. Is it the shoes? The shoes of peace. So let, let's just uh, recap. The belt of truth comes from who? Jesus. The breastplate of righteousness comes from who? Who do you think the peace comes from? Jesus. Let's look at that. John 14 tells us who the peace comes from. John 14, 27 says this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Where does your peace come from? From Jesus. I do not give you the peace as the world gives it. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. God gives us the peace, the shoes of the soldier. If you see these shoes, they're sandals. And the, the original one was probably a bit more of a boot. It came up at least two years and was tied up. And they actually had shin guards also. And then those shoes used to be hit through with nails or spikes so that when they were on the battlefield, they didn't fall over. It was like a, a rugby tog or a soccer tog. You know, they got the things underneath it. I don't know. I've never even put one on, but I've seen them, all right? So you have those things underneath. So when they're on the thing, they don't fall over. And that's exactly what it is. It's the shoes of peace. Jesus gives us his peace so that we won't fall over in times of battle, in times of hardship, in times of the storm. You see, if I look around in a spiritual sense, many, many Christians are on their backs. They've fallen over because they don't have the peace of Jesus. When crisis comes, when the storm comes, when the battle rages around them, they fall over because they're not centered and stable in the peace that comes from Jesus. We have to have a contentment that Jesus Christ is with us and nothing formed will ever come against us. Amen? That's the peace that Jesus gives us, not as the world gives. It's a peace that transcends all understanding, the Bible says. It's when whatever comes around you, the people are around you, they're sick, there's somebody that you just lost a loved one, and, and your business is failing, and people look at you, and they cannot understand how you are not getting upset and freaked out by it. You know what that is? It's the peace of Jesus. It's a sense of peace that no matter what's going on around me, I love you, Lord, I worship you. And I know that all things work together for the good, for those that love you. So it's the shoes of peace. Let's look at our helmet. It's a helmet of what? Salvation. I love this helmet that we've got here because you can see it actually covers, I don't want to stand too near to this guy because if he falls on me, I'm dead. All right? <laughs> Marcus, just stay there. The, the, the helmet had a, a covering on the side and a covering at the back. And that was actually because... The foot soldier, their worst enemy was the cavalry. And that was the guys that came riding on the horses. And they would just come riding onto the field and they had these long, big broadswords. And they would just come in and they would just chop off heads left, right, and center. So they needed this covering to keep their head on the body. If the head wasn't on the body, Exactly. Game over again. Don't pass begin. No 200 bucks. All right. So you needed the head to stay on your body. So that's why they had that beautiful covering. So at least when the sword came, it would just hit the helmet and not actually damage the head. It's a helmet of what? Salvation. Righteousness comes from Jesus. Truth comes from Jesus. Peace comes from Jesus. Where do you think your salvation comes from? From Jesus. Let's read that in Acts. Acts chapter 4. It says this. Acts chapter 4, 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which men must be saved. And whose name is that? Jesus. It's the very name of Jesus Christ. Our salvation comes not from ourselves, it's not from your works. You cannot get into heaven by anything you do. It's solely based on what Jesus Christ has done for you. The salvation comes from him. If you ask Christians, there's two groups of Christians. I always ask them this. The first question is, are you born again? And when you die, will you go to heaven? And there's always two different responses I get. The one Christian says, 
I really hope so, Raymond. You know, it's been a bit of a rough month. I've been ups and downs, and I've, I've sinned a bit, and, and I've been to church once or twice, but, you know, I really don't know if I'm going to get in. I hope when I get there, God weighs up my good deeds, and, and I hope I get in. And then you get another Christian that says, yes, I'm born again, I'm going to heaven, because my access into heaven is not on anything I do, but on what Jesus Christ has done for me when he died for me, and he forgave me of my sins and rose again to offer me that eternal life. Yes, I'm on my way to heaven because Jesus Christ died for me. Do you see the difference? The one Christian is basing his access into heaven on his own performance, her own performance. I'll make into heaven because of something I do. That's not the biblical doctrine of salvation. Salvation is through Jesus Christ and him alone. Whoever may call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, and that Lord is Jesus Christ. The salvation that you have comes from Jesus. That's what I love about these first four parts. They're the part that cover your body, and they all come from Jesus, representing that you are clothed with Jesus. Do you understand that? You are covered with Jesus, and everything that Jesus has, you now have. You have his salvation. You have his righteousness. You have his truth, and you have his peace. Amen. Do you see that? All right, let's look at our, our next part of the equipment, and that is the shield of faith. Now, if you look at this shield, it's a bit of a round one, and they did use this in the, in the Roman times. During the battles, they used round shields, and, and it done the job, but in the original language that Paul was writing, he doesn't use this one. He uses a different word called skratam, and this is a large shield, and the large shield was about 1.2 meters high. I don't know. I'm probably about one. I'm probably about one. So <laughs> it's about 1.2 meters high and about a half a meter wide. It was a big rectangular shield, a very, very big one, which could almost cover the entire body of the soldier. So that's what this, the, the shield that Paul was talking about. It wasn't a small round one. It was a big, huge one that actually doubled as a stretcher. Do you know that? So it was so big that if somebody fell in battle, they would just throw him onto the shield and pull the shield off. So that was just a great asset to the soldier himself. And that one, what was leather bound, what they actually done, they say, was they used to put it in water overnight. So it used to soak up all the water. So the next day when they ran into battle, when those arrows came flying, those flaming arrows, it would be extinguished on this now weathered shield that the soldier had. So it's a very big shield, and it is called the shield of what? Faith. Now understand this. The parts on the body, that's Jesus. But the shield of faith, faith comes from God the Father. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you are saved. And then he says, it is not of yourself, not of works, it is a gift of God. So that shield comes from God the Father. He gives you faith to fight the battle that you're in. And the arrows will come. Let, right now in this church, the devil and his demons are waiting. And they are lined up on the battlefield, and they are like the archers. They have their arrows ready, and they're flaming, and they are ready to let that go. And you know who the target is? You. You. You, the Christian. The devil's not worried about non-believers. He's worried about you, the Christian. And the better you are as a Christian, the more arrows will come. Right now, you have a target on your back, and those flaming arrows are going to come. They're not physical arrows. They're spiritual arrows. Ar arrows of temptation, depression, anxiety, fear, discouragement, deception. All those arrows are aimed at you right now in this church. And if you don't have the shield of faith, you are going to fall in that battle. And all you must do, God says, is take the shield. You just got to lift up that shield of faith and say, devil, you bring it on. I'm ready for you. Nothing is going to touch me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, the Bible says. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. As you lift up that shield, you declare God's power over you and the situation. The very first verse was, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. So that shield is God and his strength that's going to protect you from all those arrows that are coming. When those arrows, arrows come and they will, you put up that shield and you just start declaring God's power and strength over you, your family, and your situation. These parts come from Jesus. The shield comes from God the Father. Let's look at our last one, the most important one. All of these are for defense. You see that? This is to protect you, that is to defend and deflect the arrows. In this whole episode, there's only one weapon for offense. There's only one weapon to fight with. 
And that is the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And now you look at the guy and you think, well, this is like a puny sword. What's he going to do with that? This is like something that Raymond would carry into battle. But the thing is, <laughs> but the thing is this, there were two swords that they used during the Roman army. One was a broad sword, a long, one meter long, heavy sword. All right? And they used to do that. Calvary used to use those ones, the guys on the horses. They used to use the big broad swords. But there was a problem with the foot soldiers wielding these swords because they were pretty big and heavy. So, for example, I am a Roman soldier. As you can see, I am still tall, dark, and handsome and very muscular. And now I'm a Roman soldier, right? So now I have to go into battle. And now I've got a sword that's probably the same size as me and probably, probably heavier than I am anyway. All right, I have to go into battle with this big broad sword. So I'm trying to wield it, and, and as I swing it over, uh, I just get enough strength to swing it over, and then it smacks into the ground and gets stuck there. And now I'm struggling to get it out. And now I become a Christian and pray that the other guy's very patient. All right? Uh, uh, so he's looking at me thinking, do you need help there, Raymond? Can, can I help you pull that sword out? You see what the difficulty is with a broadsword? Not very practical when it comes to foot soldiers hand-to-hand -hand battle. So the Romans revolutionized that. They gave the soldiers small swords. And that's what the word means in original language. Mekaira in the Greek. It's a short sword. Now this was easy to wield, easy to get out and in, and you could do the same hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat instead of with a broad sword, now with a short sword. So this is a very good representation of what the sword looks like. And I would love to take the sword out and play with it, but I can't because it's stuck to your hand, Marcus. <laughs> Just that being said, um, if, uh, I, you know that I would have loved to have worn this today. I think you, you guys know that's our role. Uh, you were all expecting me to run around in this, but I couldn't get it off Marcus, all right? But I'm going to ask the congregation to help me if you can assist me in making an outfit like this that can fit this unique physique. <laughs> Not so heavy. <laughs> Please come and see me afterwards because I would just die to run around the pulpit with this on, waving my sword around. So if you can help me, I, I want a suit like this. I'm, gonna go, I'm definitely going to do this again sometime. It's the sword of the spirit. The items on your body, you close with Jesus. The shield that you take is of God. And the sword is of the spirit. You see the trinity in this. Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, what is that sword? It says, it is a sword of the Spirit, so we know the Holy Spirit gives it to you, and it is the Word of God. Did you get that part? But in the Greek, there's two different Greek words for word. Let me say that again. There's two different Greek words for the word word. Word. For you guys. <laughs> Did you get that part? Word, all right? So there's two Greek words for that word. The first one is logos. Everybody say logos. L-O-G-O-S, the Logos. You've probably heard of that before. And that word is Logos, the entire Bible. I'm going to say this slowly. Logos is the entire written word. Logos is the entire written word of God, the full counsel of God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. The full 31,000 verses in the Bible. This is the Logos. There's another word for word in the Bible in the Greek, and that is the word rhema. R-H-E-M-A. Everyone say rhema. Rhema. This is a little bit different from Logos. Rhema is a specific spoken word. Did you get the difference there? Eh? Logos, entire written word. Rhema is a specific verse spoken. And you know what's interesting? When Paul wrote these words in Ephesians, he didn't use the word logos. He said the sword of the Spirit is the rhema of God. Isn't that interesting? So the sword is not the entire Bible. It's one specific verse for a specific situation. That's what rhema is. Let me put it in, the, in terms of army and navy and stuff. The, the Bible is the full armory of God. All right? And in the armor of God, there's 31,000 different weapons you can use. All right? Logos. Rhema is when you go into the armory and select one weapon. Do you get that picture? 
So I'll give another illustration is this. Imagine this whole screen behind me is my armory. All right, and on this wall, I have 31,000 knives and swords. And you may ask why, because that's the way I roll. All right, <laughs> I've got 31,000 knives and swords. All right, you don't want to get me in a dark alley, people. Are they? All right. So this is my armory. I've got 31,000 swords and knives here, and now I've got a specific situation. I want to cut bread. So I've got a loaf of bread. I want to cut it. Do I use all the knives? No. Do I use a broadsword? No. Do I use a butter knife? No. I go and look at all my knives, and I pick the bread cutting knife. And then I come and take that specific weapon for my specific situation, and I cut the bread. That's what Rhema is, and how powerful that is in our lives. You see, when you have a specific situation that you're going through, for example, fear and loneliness. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by fear and loneliness, and, and I've got the full armory of God, the Logos, but I only need one Rhema. I need to choose a verse from the Bible to apply to my situation. Now, I could use Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but does that apply to my situation? No, it doesn't. So I've got to look through the Bible, my armory, and choose one that applies to my situation. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, they will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, it comforts me. You see, one verse specific to my situation. That is the word rhema. And we see this beautiful displayed in conclusion in Matthew chapter 4, in the temptation of Jesus. Jesus has just been baptized. He goes into the desert for 40 days. He's fasting. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't drank anything. The devil comes to him. The devil comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I see you hungry. He says, why don't you take one of these stones and turn it into bread? What does Jesus do? He uses the sword of the Spirit, rhema. He goes into the armory of God. Jesus selects one verse from Deuteronomy. And he says, man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the word, from the mouth of God. You see what Jesus did? He went into the Logos and he chose one weapon to defeat the devil. The devil then decides to take him to the top of the temple and says, Jesus, jump off and the angels will come and protect you and save you. What does Jesus do again? Sword of the Spirit. Rhema, he goes to the Bible. Again to Deuteronomy. I love Jesus. Very systematic. He sticks in Deuteronomy. And he says that you will not tempt the Lord your God. Again, what did he do? He used one verse specific to his situation. You see where this is going. Third time he takes him to a high mountain and says, Jesus, I'll give you all of these kingdoms if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus goes back into Deuteronomy. Chooses Rhema. One word. One verse from Deuteronomy. And he says, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God and worship only him. Do you know what happened exactly after Jesus said that? The devil left him and angels came to assist him. Now, think about it. Jesus could have done a lot of things. He could have went, Ooh, watch out! He didn't do that. He could have taken the Torah out and hit the devil over the head with it. He didn't do that. He could have called angels down. He didn't do that. What did Jesus do? He quoted scripture. Rhema, the specific spoken word of God. And the third time, the devil left him and angels came to assist him. That is what the sword of the spirit is. Out of all of this, is for defense. This is the one we fight with people. Today, you have a specific situation. Go to the Logos and find your rhema. And that's how you're going to defeat the devil. Today, you are a soldier of God. Congratulations, you have just enlisted in the army. All right, all, don't, I don't care how old you are, young you are, or a boy or a girl, we're all soldiers in the army of Almighty God. And right now, you have the armor of God. Some people say that you must every morning put on the armor. That's not what the Bible says. In the original language, it says once you put it on, you keep it on. You never take it off. How can you take off the salvation of Jesus or his righteousness? You can't take it off. So when you got this on, you keep it on forever and ever. You never take it off. Never one day will you go into battle without this full armor on. You have been covered with Jesus. His salvation, 
his righteousness, his truth, and his peace. Right now you have the shield of God to deflect any arrows from the enemy. The most important weapon you got is the sword of the Spirit. So this is what you're going to do today, friends. This is what you're going to do. Whatever your situation is today, and I know we have different struggles and troubles and situations. You're going to go to Google because Google's got all the answers, all right? People say that the Bible's got all the answers. Google's got all the answers. You're going to go to Google. You're going to type in Bible verses about your situation. For example, fear. I'm just going to use that as my example. Bible verses about fear. And the verses will come up. What you're going to do is write them down and go find them in your Bible. You're going to mark those verses in your Bible. And then you're going to keep them handy. And in a week when you become overwhelmed with fear, you're going to stand tall as a soldier with your armor on and say, Devil, I know what you're trying to do. But get back. I'm ready for you. I've got the armor. I've got my shield. You can bring it on. I am ready for you. And then you open up your Bible to those verses. And you speak those verses out over your life. And you know what? You're going to feel a bit of a draft when that happens. You know what that draft is? It's the devil running from you, and it's the angels coming down to help and assist you. You're going to feel a lot of a, you're going to feel this updraft of wind all of a sudden because you spoke the word of God and the devil ran with his tail between his legs. Today you leave this church a soldier in the army of God. You have been clothed with everything that Jesus has given you. You have the shield of God and you have the sword of the Spirit. You leave this church not only as a soldier, but knowing that the victory has already been won. Now, that's the beauty of us as Christians. We fight in a battle, but the victory is already ours. We must still fight, though, but we know that the victory has been won in Jesus Christ. Leave this church today as a soldier. Leave this church with your armor, with your sword and your shield, knowing that Jesus has already given you the victory. Amen and amen. God bless you.